the movie on entering the second part of, uh, of this class, of this course. Uh, and uh, today we will uh, start or we will seriously um, take into consideration the, the theme of uh, negation, negativity, Vermeidung uh, through a kind of attentive reading of this uh, really short but nevertheless very uh, dense and paradoxical also at some point paper of Freud on negation. Uh, on which I will comment on today, uh, and then uh, we'll move on from this, uh, probably yeah, directly tomorrow, into this kind of a little bit broader theme of negativity as uh, articulated or um, existing as a certain practice through this whole uh, uh, theme of nihilism, nihilism, uh, and uh, so we will discuss, we will continue to discuss this question of relationship precisely between negativity and uh, uh, positivity or affirmation, negation, and perhaps something ter third that comes to be, to get articulated in their dialectics uh, on the theory of a discussion of uh, nihilism, Introducing, reintroducing, of course, uh, some of uh, Nietzsche's important points in this respect, uh, but not only in respect to nihilism, but also this will lead us, as you will see, to the theme of the repetition, the so relationship to the eternal return, and so on. So this second part will be a little bit more in Nietzsche, and although I will still kind of keep this perspective that. Uh, we, will, we were uh, walking on from the beginning, and which is also the question of the real and of its possible articulation with the means of the symbolic, with the uh, paradoxical means of the symbolic and negation will also, as we shall see, uh, allow us to perhaps uh, see how this can function, one of the ways in which this can function. Um, so, this uh, Freud's essay on for nine, you know, as I said, it's a very short essay. And of course, at the first sight, really, I, I hope you had the chance to, to check it out. It seems uh, like a rather, I don't know, just a fleeting comment or a kind of a short observation, uh, mostly of technical character in the sense that it's kind of an advice if you hear this and that in analysis, you can be sure that. It means this and that. Um, and of course, uh, this Freud's most uh, famous, well-known example is this uh, amusing remark made by a patient at some point who says, you ask who this person in my dream uh, can be, it is not my mother. Die Mutter es ist nicht, is the German formulation. So, in which case, first, as far as first, this immediate movement. In this case, you can be sure that it is indeed her. Uh, and he goes on to say that every time, every explicit negation of this sort, every strong, uh, strongly emphasized distancing from a certain content that it nevertheless mentioned, becomes a strong indicator uh, precisely of the truth of this contact towards which we are trying to distance so uh, uh, emphatically. And of course this holds true only in the cases where the, the uh, analysant himself or herself comes out with this content or intention. It's not something that one needs to decipher beyond whatever. It, it is openly said, yet accompanied with denial or uh, this or the distance. For example, there is another example that Freud gives. Now you think that I mean to say something insulting to you, but really I have no such intention. So it's again this kind of mechanism. So this is the kind of a beginning of the essay. But then the more we, uh, the more we advance into it, uh, the more this seemingly technical inambiguity of examples uh, stays behind and what comes to the foreground is a kind of a 
fascinating knot of practically all key problems and notions of psychoanalysis uh, organized precisely around a particular and evading negativity which is simply precisely not reduced to the negation logic of simple logic of negation of negation mm -hmm. the opposite of the negated being through so this knot of central co concept as this kind of evading negativity as its central focus around which it kind of distributes and and where it really soon becomes clear that negativity at work uh, in this uh, some of the very funny examples it's not reducible to a simple opposite of positivity or of affirmation it is not reducible to truthfulness <coughs> of, of its opposite it becomes clear quite clearly stated by translating it is not matter into it is matter we don't come very far for as he noticed the symptoms tend to persist we do this so everything is supposed to be clear but the symptoms persist it is as if nothing happened and the real problem as well as the main part of analytical work actually only starts here um, for what comes to light is precisely a certain I would say crack or uh, internal interval which is at work in the relationship between all these ser series of crucial categorial couples um, that Freud em employs to kind of circumscribe what he's doing uh, this gap which kind of systematically tends to undermine the complementariness and sy symmetry of these couples like inside outside this is part of what he's doing or then pleasure beyond the pleasure principle or repression becoming consciousness of the repressed or affective intellectual or eros destructive drive there are all these conceptual couples with which he uh, tries to um, circumvent circumscribe this place and actually what happens with in every particular step is precisely that some uh, eludial third kind of uh, disturbs the symmetry or the complementarity of these uh, of these couples and of course this is probably no surprise considering that what is introduced by this Freudian notion of negation is as I said pre precisely not reducible to the alternative P or not P it is mother, it isn't mother um, we could simply say that we are not dealing with negation as it operates in, in classical logic which uh, as you know in kind of relies on these two fundamental principles one is the principle of the excluded contradiction or principle of non-contradiction that one cannot assert simultaneously uh, or in the same context the proposition P and the proposition on P and the other is of course the principle of the excluded middle or excluded third expression that I prefer uh, which is to say that if you have a proposition P either P is true or P is false so that either P is true or non-P is true this is the other way of putting it we cannot have a third possibility so this is uh, what the classical logic is founded upon um, and of course as a consequence of the second principle of the excluded middle there is also this principle of double negation that if we you negate a negation negation of negation uh, is equivalent to affirmation you come back to the beginning or it is equivalent to affirmation but of course uh, as you also know uh, this classical negation is not the only logical possibility that there is uh, philosophically this is quite uh, evident I don't know so this is to take no, not only the more modern or obvious case of, of Nietzsche uh, um, but also supposedly more classical example of Hegel uh, who precisely affirms that negation of negation does not it's not equivalent to uh, the immediate affirmation and for whom moreover contradiction uh, is not at all an obstacle 
but the very motor of the dialectical movement of, uh, of logic. So uh, I'm just briefly uh, entering this discussion because I want to via this uh, picturing of how this works in classical and non-classical logics, uh, try to hinder, uh, come to the fact, uh, um, to the point of showing how Freudian uh, question here may make us attentive to yet another dimension, which is not, uh, uh, which is a little bit irreducible even to this. Um, non-classical attempts to uh, think the negation. Uh, you know, there are basically two uh, uh, attempts. One is the so-called intuition, intuitional log intuitionist logic, and the other is um, uh, the paraconsistent logic. Uh, in the intuitionist logic, uh, basically, you have uh, the negation that obeys the first principle, the principle of contradiction, but not the principle of the excluded middle. This is how it works in the intuition. Uh, the other one, the paraconsistent logic, you have the negation that obeys the principle of the excluded middle, but not the principle of contradiction. Whereas the fourth possibility where negation would uh, obey neither of the two principles is simply uh, uh, excluded by logics on the grounds that it amounts to a kind of complete dissolution of all power and all potency of negativity. But I think what is interesting, if we now return to Freud, uh, <laughs> 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 Uh, I think that uh, what is interesting is that uh, one might have the impression that the logical frame implied by a psychoanalysis uh, is uh, something close to, uh, if precisely we start from the idea that uh, we have a negation which is not simply reducible to the opposite of uh, affirmation, uh, we could simply have the idea that Freud seems to be sub subscribing to the intuitionist logic as opposed to the classical one. Uh, however, and I think this is precisely what is most intriguing and could be rather far-reaching, is that this is not, I think, exactly the case for what is the standard presentation of the intuitionist logic. It is that it allows for things existing between the two extremes or the two absolutes between an absolute P and an absolute non-P, there is a whole world, so to say. There are all kinds of nuances with different shades or degrees of intensity. And of course you can recognize a lot of what Nietzsche is saying here, this kind of precise word as the, the whole world as precisely a word of nuances. And of course, because it allows for different degrees of, of intensity, the, the potency of negation is, in this case, weaker than it is in the classical logic. And uh, if I just give you an example of what would be the intu intuitionist logic, an example uh, suggested by, uh, by Badiou, who, who wrote an article also on these three kinds of negations, uh, the example he gives is or the, the, the example of the law. So if the great field of the law is always uh, a concrete world or a concrete construction, its logic is not classical. <coughs> if we take law in its strict legal sense, we know that perfectly well. If the sentence P is guilty and non-P is, inno uh, non is innocent, we, uh, we have always a great number of intermediate values like guilty with attenuating circumstances, or innocent because certainly guilty but with insufficient proof, and so on. If I say in a concrete world, I'm not guilty, maybe this is true, but it is practically never absolutely true because everybody is guilty more or less. This is the end of quote of this example. So you see here the idea is that within this kind of logic, it is always, or the logic of the concrete world, or the logic of appearance, is precisely this non-absolute 
different degrees of intensity. Intuition is logic which um, allows this sense for the existence of a third thing between the two. Uh, but what uh, kind of I don't know, the idea that I have and I'd like to argue for is that what is at stake uh, in this uh, Freudian discovery that with negation involved in the unconsciousness, the alternative matter, non-matter, is not exhaustive and the negation of negation doesn't bring us to the supposedly original affirmation, uh, I think it's, it's something else that this uh, logic of different degrees of intensity. So, because actually, if you just think of this example, what and you see what we come to is not a more or less matter. It is matter, but not completely. It is not a difference of intensity with regards to two extremes or two absolutes. It's either it is or it is in this absolute sense. <coughs> and I think this is precisely perhaps a very important question brought by psychoanalysis to the attention of both philosophy and logic, uh, which could be formulated as follows. If we admit the non-functioning, non perishability non of the principle of the excluded third, what then exactly is the status of the third that we allow for in this way? Is it something in between, a combination of two, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a nuance with certain degree of intensity? Or could it also be effectively something else? This is said precisely something third, in this a little bit stronger meaning of the word, related, of course, to this configuration, not third, it's simply something completely different, but. Uh, something of a third with its own ontological status, even if the later turns out to be rather paradoxical. Or spectral, if you prefer to it And um, I will kind of try to show or argue for this uh, other option. And I think, again, that some of Nietzsche can also be found here. You know, this theme of the third eye, third ear, something that kind of... Um, points precise goes in the again in a different direction that simply the logic of the uh, nuances. So and apart from this, this is one uh, thing that uh, I will try to um, uh, argue for. Uh, but apart from this uh, and related to it Freud's paper, this paper also offers some kind of extremely dense uh, almost fascinatingly wild speculation concerning the very origin of thought and of speculation which uh, stupefied Jean Hippolyte, the uh, famous French philosopher Gillian, in his commentary uh, of, of the Freudian essay, which he delivered upon Lacan's invitation in his seminar, and there he concentrated, of course, precisely on the negation of negation, but also on this stunningly uh, courageous attempt, maybe psychological attempt of Freud to kind of um, show argue for a certain birth of thinking from the spirit of negation, so to say, you know, or more precisely, perhaps from the mark of negation, because this is also what is at stake. It's not simply um, negation, it's not to be taken simply as already full, referring directly to the content. It's uh, of course, indistinguishable for, from a content, but it's also the question of the very mark of negation as an also pure signifying mark that is of importance here. It is not in itself negative, this mark. And it seems indeed that this essay of negation is also a kind of a quitting point of philosophy and psychoanalysis. And this is also one, the other part that I will try to focus on. So, let, uh, let's start again from Freud and from this sentence you ask who this person in the dream can be, it is not my mother. Uh, so without being asked, of course, who played part in this dream, this person, this patient rushes forward and volunteers the word mother, accompanied by negation. It is as he 
as if he has to say it, but at the same time cannot. It is imperative and impossible, uh, and impossible at the same time. And so the result is that the word is uttered as denied. The expression, the repression, sorry, coexists with the thing being consciously fully spoken out. This is a basic configuration. And I think the first mistake that one could make here is to take this, uh, to read this in terms of what this person and really saw in his dream, but then because of some se uh, consciousness censorship decided to lie about it in, uh, to, to them. It's, uh, it's not at all this what is at stake. Uh, not only in the case of Fermain, but also in the case of uh, Freudian notion of the unconsciousness as such, uh, the point is that what is unconscious is not simply, uh, uh, in, the case, in this case particularly, what is unconscious is about all precisely the censorship. It is this what is kind of uh, uh, swept away from the perspective. It is not the object of the mother, but precisely what happens with this know that kind of pops up. So the mother is fully present in the statement and introduced by the subject himself who, had, who, who also could have simply not mentioned her. So the, the, the unconscious sticks here to the distortion itself, to, this is to say to the negation, and it's not hidden in what the subject supposedly really saw or didn't see in his dream. It could well be that in the dream actually the mother did not appear or that some unknown person appears. Yet the story of the unconscious is that is relevant for analysis begins precisely with this not my mother that takes place in the account of the dream, this utterance which it is formulated. So perhaps the first point to make is that this certainty emphasized by Freud in this context that we can be certain that it is indeed this or that, is not simply certainty perhaps regarding the given content, mother in this case, but first and foremost the certainty regarding the fact that we are indeed dealing with the intrusion of the unconscious. <coughs> and as I said, the problem only really begins here. As a matter of fact, Freud goes on to say that even though in analysis we can bring this person to withdraw the knot and to accept the content of the repressed, uh, I quote, the repressive process itself is not yet removed by this. So we can say the negation itself is negated or removed. We are dealing, we are get to something like it is not, not my mother. But something of it persists. The repression, the symptoms persist beyond becoming <coughs> conscious of the repression. Um, and of course here we come across an absolutely crucial fundamental discovery of psychoanalysis which, uh, in which, uh, without which the, the later would amount to finally little more than a hermeneutics of the unconscious, depending entirely on the correct interpretation or translation of the text deformed by the unconscious into its full and non-deformed version, which is of course not at all what this is about. And uh, of course soon after his early enthusiasm, because it is true that at the beginning Freud kind of believed that this could be possible, but soon after his first enthusiasm uh, that things might indeed work this way, he came against the problem that precisely they don't. And the, the right interpretation and its exceptions doesn't yet eliminate the symptom that the real kernel of the unconscious is not to be situated, for instance in the case of the dreams, neither in the latent content as opposed to the manifest content, uh, but precisely in this very work of the deformation and what motivates. So perhaps just for, for our present purposes, and at this stage, this, this could be formulated as follows. We can accept the repressed content, why not? We can eliminate it, but we cannot eliminate uh, the structure of the gap or crack 
that generates it and that helps generate it and it is employed in the very work of generating it, this distortion. And it is this irreducible crack that becomes kind of visible through the double negation as its indivisible reminder. It is what nevertheless persists. Say at the stage when we are dealing with something like if we are dealing with something like it is not not matter, this double negation and it circumscribes something which makes it irreducible either to simply matter or her absence. In a certain sense, we could also resume this by saying that finally the patient, what the patient wanted to say is precisely what he said, not something else. N namely that it is neither that it was some other person than the mother, nor that it was mother, but that it was the not mother, or the mother not, perhaps. And to give you a kind of uh, more palpable perhaps, <coughs> idea of what this bizarre reminder or negativity could be of how could it, could it function materially, uh, I can give you an example of a, of a, of a joke that I uh, like a lot and also use a lot with kinds of really, it's a kind of my team if we go to that, precisely of this um, logic of this positive negativity and actually it's a joke from uh, Ernest Lubitsch's movie, Ninochka, but it is told as a joke in, in this movie. Uh, and uh, the joke goes like this, that there is a guy who enters a restaurant and says to the waiter, coffee without cream, please. And the waiter replies, I'm sorry, sir, but we are out of cream. Could it be without milk? <laughs> and I think it's precisely, uh, this uh, captures very, very well what uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to circumscribe here. This carries a certain real, uh, even a certain truth about the real, which has to do precisely with the singular negativity um, introduced here, for example, in this uh, Freud's essay. A negation of something which is not pure absence or pure nothing, or simply the complementary of what, is, what it negates. Because at the moment it is spoken, there remains a trace of that which is not. Uh, this is a dimension introduced and made possible by the signifier red, irreducible to it. It has or can have a positive, positive albeit spectral quality, which can be formulated, I think, with the precise formula in terms of with, without. Like in this with, without, this with, without, uh, is what comes across this kind of, if you don't have cream, then it should be without milk. So this with, without, as irreducible to both alternatives, cream or no cream. And here, by the way, we come back to a point that we were discussing on some of the earlier days, namely, <coughs> how is it that we find in Lacan's work whole arsenal of such this type of uh, seemingly extremely complicated double negations, negative statements uh, but which are precisely seem not equal to the negation of their opposite and of course this starts with the unconsciousness itself which is not the opposite of the consciousness in psychoanalysis then you know, there is this the other doesn't exist, which doesn't mean that there is simply nothing there. And there are these kind of formulations, definitions of, for instance, necessity and contingency that, that Lacan proposes. He defines necessity as doesn't stop being written. This is his way of defining necessity. Again, a very kind of uh, twisted formulation. And the definition of contingency stops not being written, something happens by stopping not being written. So that, again, uh, there's a whole movement in this, behind this. Uh, 
and of course this arsenal of double negations, you know, the, the, the way he defines anxiety precisely is uh, that um, in anxiety the object, uh, what, what happens in anxiety is that the lack comes to lack, comes, uh, le manque vient à manquer, the lack comes to be lacking. So, which is not the same as simply to say that we have some pure positivity. There is some constitutive lack that all of the sudden is no longer there, and this is the fundament of, of anxiety. I mean, it's not uh, simply a confrontation of some full positivity, but nevertheless, uh, so there is, um, there are all these uh, uh, statements and all these ways of circumscribing, attempting to circumscribe something, uh, which as if could not be stated directly. We can see that when, uh, back to Freud, when mother does appear in this singular alloy or composition with negation, as not mother, it looks as if and of both terms irredeemably contaminate, uh, contaminated each other. As if the not marked the mother with the stamp of unconscious desire, Freud says he uses this uh, funny term, like made in Germany stamped on the object, and on the other hand, a mother no less contaminated the, 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 the word mother no less contaminated the former purity of negation with as we sometimes read on the packing of certain kinds of food, certain elements in traces. But perhaps we should be more precise even and say that the mother we start with, and perhaps this is how we can define the problem. Um, the mother we start with, just before the negation hits her, so to say, is precisely not the same as the object mother produced through this negation, via the work of the unconsciousness. It is another mother, a mother, put it this way, with consequences, in respect to what we've been discussing a couple of days ago, not mother as element of nature. And it is precisely why admitting to the analyst that it has been mother after all doesn't help at the least, because the object has changed in between, it's not longer the same. And why, in spite of this admission, the essence of repression persists? For what we get in this way is of no use to us. It refers only to mother as factual, as element of nature, so to say it, it doesn't bring us any closer to the uh, dimension of, of the real that is at stake here. Before now continue um, reading and commenting on this Freud essay, I will make a short digression um, into Lacan's commentary, which is in fact the, the uh, reply to Ippolit's commentary, just by giving you a couple of examples through which uh, he kind of also very um, vividly brings, uh, brings forward um, the situation, the constellation that is at stake with this kind of negation or, um, or negativity uh, and actually he, uh, his first um, comparison with what is going on here is perhaps rather stunning because it's a comparison has, uh, with a certain uh, piece of hallucination um, hallucination which appears uh, it's a famous hallucination with from a Freud case, uh, the Wolf's Man. Um, and um, I, I will just read you this hallucination and then explain what, what Lacan is in what way it could be related to what is going on in uh, Fernino, in this appearance of something without fully seeing what it appears. So this hallucination is simply the fourth, this is Freud's account of it, or this is his patient's account of it. Well, I was five years old, he says, I was playing in the garden near my nurse and was carving with my pocket knife in the bark of one of the walnut trees that, uh, that came into my dream as well. Suddenly, to my unspeakable terror, I noticed that I had cut through my little finger so that it was hanging on by its skin. I felt no pain, but great fear. 
I did not venture to say anything to my nurse, who was only a few pieces distant, but I sank down on the nearest seat and sat there incapable of casting another glance at my finger. At last I calmed down, took a look at the finger and saw that it was entirely uninjured. Uh, so we had this kind of hallucination of the finger being cut off. And of course Freud himself, when he was commenting on this, uh, uh, described this as an instance of Verwerfung, you know, this uh, term related to psychosis as foreclosure, as foreclosure of uh, castration as opposed to repression. This is to say precisely that in this case, for Freud, it's a kind of case where castration is not denied or repressed, but literally cut from the subject symbolic universe. It has no role whatsoever, it doesn't motivate any repression. It's literally cut out of the symbolic universe which is why then it can only return in the form of a hallucination, that is to say in the real, as part of the real, of the reality of the subject. So uh, this is basic constellation, definition of psychosis. It's the real with to, in which the subject starts with speechless terror without being able to integrate it in the surrounding reality. So this is the hallucination episode, and in his recapitulation of this episode, uh, Lacan uses some very telling expressions. He speaks about kind of temporal abyss and about how what Freud patient says suggests that it is not simply that he sinks into immobility, but that he sinks into a kind of temporal funeral out of which he eventually rises without having been able to count how many times he has wound around during his descent and his renaissance and without his return to the surface of ordinary time having in any way occurred in response to an effort of his part. So I think this is a very poignant description of what is taking place here, this kind of a temporal abyss. Um, and uh, travel into some something somewhere as if some other dimension of a reality out of which it reemerges. Um, but this temporal funeral, this metaphor, is in fact related to another crucial moment of this same story. That I'm still in this uh, Wolfsman uh, case, namely that uh, the hallucination, as such, such as I just uh, told you about it, erratically appeared uh, when this Wolfman, I mean, pseudonym, uh, was five years old. But it comes to him now with the conviction, he tells about it in Freud, and it's the first time that he tells about it, but it comes to him with the conviction, and this is a very interesting structure, conviction whose falsity is soon demonstrated, that he has already told Freud about it at some point. So the narrative about the, the hallucination is kind of a framed by a redoubling, Related, uh, and this redoubling is related by both Freud and Lacan to the phenomena of déjà vu, you know, this uh, déjà vu or broader déjà entendu, déjà éprouvé, déjà senti, déjà raconté, this all sentiment that I already heard this exact word somewhere or I experienced this at some point in exactly the same way. I felt this in this way, uh, I already told you about this, as in this case. So in other words, in the relation to the, related to the configuration in which, uh, this is related to configuration in which something appears for the say, first time, but is mediated by the feeling of being its own repetition. It's experienced as already being its own repetition, something already seen, told, etc. And actually we could say that uh, in the present case that we are discussing, this déjà vu, or more presently uh, déjà raconté, is precisely that what manages to link for the subject in question, or to attach the psychotic structure of hallucination, which is completely cut off of the symbolic universe, based on foreclosure, what 
uh, allows it to be linked, to get linked to the, let's say, this more neurotic structure based simply on uh, repression, in which makes it possible for the patient to actually talk about it in the first place, because he was never able to talk about it at all. And it's precisely via this déjà raconté framework that he was now actually able for the first time to, to speak about it. And this also somehow follows only from Freud's own discussion of this case, to which he returns uh, at a later point in a short essay on post reconnaissance. Again, this kind of uh, uh, false memory, where he claims that uh, the patient expresses with false memory in his uh, what is expressed in this false memory is precisely the resistance to accept this uh, castration design. But of course, uh, what is interesting that is that here we are no longer at the level of foreclosure or psychosis, but on the level preci precisely of res repression or resistance that related to it. And here, with this déjà vu, déjà raconté, we are in fact dealing with a structure very similar to that of Fernaidic or negation, uh, um, and uh, in which Freud recognizes precisely something more general. And he says that during this kind of analytical treatment, it often happens that the patient accompanies his reporting a fact he remembered with the following remark. I already told you this. Although one can be sure that it hadn't uh, been the case. So like in the case of negation, here also the repression can persist after the acceptance of the repressed content. And what makes this possible is that the kind of real-time, I would say real-time opening of the unconscious appears in the guise of a memory of an already accomplished fact. That is a something that no longer immediately concerns us, or never even was present, it's kind of an eternal past, never it was it never had its present. We are and viewing at something that has just emerged as belonged for the first time as belonging to some other time. Looking right at it, yet through some as if some alienating frame in the form of something already far away. So Deja Vidos paradoxically preserves the unfamiliar, the, uh, even though we would say, okay, Deja Vidos is precisely something familiar, we recognize it, but if you look at it more closely in this perspective, you see that paradoxically it's the other way around, that it preserves precisely the unfamiliar on the inassimilable character of what is being said or seen through the feeling of false recognition. Recognition is already a step away from, yeah. from the present. And that by uh, rebuffing the presence or the present time of a thing's articulation of reality is what is at stake. The, thirst, the thing first appears already as a memory of itself. So this is, this is the first example which I kind of uh, from a very different uh, order uh, again uh, brings us to this structure of uh, two things that happen at the same time, that something emerges, but uh, emerges uh, in the real, but as some real that has never had its real or its presence. Uh, and Lacan's uh, second example, the other example, uh, is uh, that of acting out. It's also very, this is a really, really funny example. Uh, and it involves, actually, here Lacan comments, comments on a report uh, of another analysis but by some American analysts, and there are lots of kind of um, hints at the stupidity of these other analysts. Uh, but anyway, the story is funny because uh, it, it involves a patient who is a professor, I think like this, who is obsessed uh, by uh, plagiarism. I mean, he cannot work because he's absolutely obsessed by this idea 
of stealing other people's ideas all, all the time. Uh, and I, I won't go into the details of the case, this is of no importance, but the point is that hope, so he has this obsession with plagiarism, of stealing other people's ideas, he cannot work because of this, and at some point his analyst, which is, who is supposed to be this classical American analyst, just serves him the explanation, his interpretation of his problems on a plate, really like, uh, like this. Uh, there is a whole passage, I mean, it's really quite amazing how he simply explains this is this, this is that, and so on. Uh, and, and the reaction of the patient to this explanation, who is supposed to, uh, to uh, put the end to the analysis, uh, the reaction of the patient to this explanation is the following remark, which really extraordinarily is taken by the analyst as simply confirming the, the success of his maneuver. He really concludes, okay, this, he's healed now, he's uh, uh, kind of, uh, okay. So this is his, the patient's response to the explanation of what is going on with him, or why was he obsessed with this plagiarism. He says, every noon when I leave here, before luncheon, and before returning to my office, I walk through X street, through some street, a street well known for its small but attractive restaurant, and I look at the menus in the windows. In one of the restaurants, I usually find my perfect dish, fresh brains. <laughs> Which is, I mean, uh, so leaving aside the fact that the, really the enemy displays an almost spectacular misapprehension of what is going on here, and takes this statement as a nice way of concluding his case, uh, we can indeed recognize in this acting out, in this sentence, Yet another version of the structure that I'm discussing. That, I mean, the repression is maintained here by the acting out of the repressed. The patient accepts his analyst explanation, which could even be accurate concerning its content. This is not so much the question. Yet the repression persists and represents, uh, and the repressed kind of returns as if outside himself, as part of the objective reality. Fresh brain, fresh ideas in the, in the shopping windows of the restaurant. The thing itself is standing right there, yet dressed in the feeling of indifferent exteriority. He's looking at it through the shopping window. He doesn't want to know anything about it, so he acts it out, or stages it, to say. Staging is actually not a bad uh, this description of this more technical mechanism known as acting out. Since it involves kind of putting something on scene precisely so as to be able to continue not to see, not to be confronted. So you, you can imagine, for instance, that uh, like the, in Hamlet, in the Shakespeare's play, uh, it were the, this murderous king Claudius himself who helped the actor staging this play within the play, the murder of Gonzago, so as to be able to keep looking away from his own acts at stages here, so as um, not to be confronted with what, what he, he did. So, uh, and as we come back to this surprising and uh, kind of surprisingly volunteered statement, again, it is not my mother. So, on the one hand, we can see the structural similarity with these cases. Nobody suggests it, but nevertheless, it is there. It's mentioned. The negation that accompanies the uh, emerging of this seems to interpose between it and the subject a strange distance or screen on account of which the subject actually does not see what he sees. Negation, to a certain extent, works in this way. It is not that he doesn't see, or, but, uh, or that he sees and denies it. Uh, what is at stake, it's rather that he doesn't, even almost like this, that he doesn't see that he sees. So similar to the cut of finger of in hallucination or this fresh brain in the shopping window, 
mother could also be said to be an object whose unconscious character here in this case is preserved in spite of this, its full visibility, in spite of it striking the eye, so to say. But uh, there is one crucial question, nevertheless, which uh, remains in this comparison, which is, if is, it, is this to say that these three interfaces, if I call them like this, déjà vu acting out or staging and negations are simply of identical nature? Are we doing with the same thing? Are they simply three different ways of preserving your full view of a thing? It's misrecognition. And here precisely I would say uh, that there, there are grounds for claiming that this not the negation has nevertheless a special singular status and structure on account of which mothering from the discussed example is an object with a slightly different status from the other two. Not because uh, it's mother, say, but because she is negated and not acted out or put in the frame of memory. And in Freud, actually, this difference is indicated by the fact that he relates this cut of negation to the very constitution of thinking, both consciousness and unconsciousness, uh, further in this essay. He sees it, in other words, as both it's appearing on both sides as both simply a trick of the unconsciousness, a means together with acting out déjà vu and many other uh, means, ways in which unconscious works, and as at the same time as a kind of condition or, or ground of its possibility, of its fundament. Uh, and this is what accounts for the kind of more exceptional and fascinating character of this Fernand in this film. It is not only that which, together with, as I said, many other unconscious mechanisms, displacements, condensations, and so on, patches up, so to say, the gaps in, of representation uh, while simultaneously pointing at them, uh, but also it is a condition of possibility of the, let's say, repression to go. So this no, the symbol of negation uh, is on the other hand, a hallmark of repression, as Freud put it, and on the other hand, the kind of constitutive condition of thinking. It is related both to the cut of the let's say, primary repression and to the active form that repression takes in any particular, each particular case. So now we'll slowly move to this other uh, part, which is more concerned precisely with this Freud genealogy of thinking or of judgment that he, he again very briefly and densely and widely uh, proposes in, this, uh, in the other uh, half of, towards, uh, of this paper. So this really extremely speculative part of Freud's essay concerns the constitution of reality also, this is also what is at stake, of reality and of the thinking subject as based on what he sees as kind of a, a original cut along the lines of appropriation or taking in as basis of affirmation, Beachung, and on the other hand, Ausstoßung, expulsion or pushing out as basis of negation. This is how he outlines this. Um, so he proposes a very dense genealogy of judgment, which sometimes reminds, of course, Nietzsche also, reminds of Nietzsche, which, in, uh, which includes two steps and coincide, these two steps coincide with the difference between, according to Freud, attributive judgments and existential judgments. So in the first case, the first step, we start with a situation, according to Freud, that has as its only and unique measure and guiding principle, pleasure. Um, and relying on which, what he calls kind of this kind of mythical 
entity of original ich, original uh, pleasure, ich, lust ich, um, which either takes things in or expels them. As Freud put it, expressed in the language of the oldest, the oral drive impulses, the judgment is, I should like to eat this, or I should like to spit it out. And to put more generally, I should like to take this into myself and to keep that out. That is to say, it shall be inside me or it shall be outside me. As I have shown elsewhere, the, or uh, the original pleasure ego wants to introject into itself everything that is good and to eject from itself everything that is bad. What is bad, what is alien to the ego and what is external are, to begin with, identical. So this is the, the quote that resumes this kind of a first movement. So this is the first split between in and out, which as you see, immediately coincides with the dividing lines between good and bad, foreign or alien, uh, and familiar. So this undoubtedly mythical being, or being of a given theoretical construction, that's for, that Freud calls as ursprüngliche Lust ich, the original pleasure ego, this divine, uh, So in this uh, case, the dividing uh, lines simply coincide. The inner, the good, and the familiar are on the one side, and the outer, the bad, and the alien on the other side. But already in the next step, the things become more complicated, and these dividing lines kind of a fall out of joint. Some kind of a uh, shift happens. So in the second stage, it is now no longer the question, says Freud, of whether what has been perceived, a thing should be taken into the ego or not, but of whether something which is in the ego as presentation can be rediscovered in perception in reality as well. It is, as we see, once more the question of external and internal. In a quote. Um, so what is at stake here, of course, is this famous reality check, uh, reality, reality testing, reality proofing, uh, based on the presupposition of a kind of original loss of pleasure. And the crucial aspect of this uh, reality test is, of course, precisely the loss of this mythical immediacy. From now on, all pleasure will be a found again pleasure. It is not something that uh, can be experienced in any immediate way. It is found again pleasure or it is not. And the same, which is interesting, goes for all objects of, of reality. The objects of reality which is thus constituted as objective reality, kind of a of representation, constituted through precisely the opposition subjective, objective. This object, they are never simply found, but always refined, as says Freud, found again, wiedergefunden. Not that there was this first thing. So, uh, the first and immediate aim, this is a quote again from Freud, therefore of reality testing is not to find an object in real perception which corresponds to the one presented, but to refine such an object to convince oneself that it is still there. So you see what this kind of a, a strange movement implied in this kind of the movement that the moment we are dealing with thinking and with certain relation to reality, which is this second step that Freud is describing, uh, both our relation uh, both our pleasure and the existence of things are no longer immediate, but bear the mark of repetition and of the gap that this repetition implies. The second repetition of dividing lines, uh, uh, the repetition of the dividing lines doesn't simply replace the first, but kind of adds to it with a twist, the result of which is a gap or a third dimension that counts from now on the very consistency 
of the distinction between inner and outer and blurs the subject-object division and relation. Or I think we could also recapitulate the, the uh, movement that Freud describes like this. The, the, the first, this kind of a mythical difference between inside and outside is not yet a real difference, but more like a kind of process of differ differentiating the indifferent or the indistinct led by the primary process or whatever you call it, pressure principle. But the latter operates, so to say, with the head on in the indifferent that it separates, but the, in, but the difference itself, the, the, the pharaoh that it leaves behind, the trace that it leaves behind, at no point enters its horizon. It is kind of a uh, mythical first cut. And the ich actually only first encounters it, this distinction, this difference, this, this trace, in the second step, when it returns in its own footsteps, so to say, but no longer finds the world as it has been before. So now there is difference, difference between inside and outside. Yet, no long, yet it no longer coincides precisely with the difference between good and bad, or pleasant and unpleasant. It no longer coincides for the condition now, in the second step, for the good and of experiencing pleasure is precisely that we find the object outside, in, uh, in the reality. Displacement took place. The object of representation had to be found outside, or else it is of no use to us. So, what has once supposedly been inside needs to be found outside, and this outside is hence very much subjectively, what we could say, mediated, which is precisely why psychoanalysis situates the, the real distribution that we are kind of tracing here neither simply in this subjective, subjective outside, nor in some kind of a pure inside, but precisely in the impossible space created by their own, the, this twist or torsion between them, what, what happens here. Now what could, we could also say that this first cut into the indifferent uh, does not only produce two slopes of reality, like inside and outside, but is itself, this cut itself, a, a material, something material, and it occupies some space. And of course, the metaphor that perhaps first comes to mind here is that of a, a crack or, or gap separating and connecting the two sides, while at the same time figuring itself as something. And Freud's key term here, which is this Ausstoßung, pushing out, also suggests this kind of a emptying of some space that has already been occupied, and with it the constitution of a kind of an <laughs> empty space in between that has nevertheless a certain status. So the cut between inside and outside, between affirmation and negation does not produce two things but three, we could say. It's affirmation of positivity, negation, absence, what is not in this sense. And we could say that the very place or locus of their difference between them, which is another difference. So my point would be that the, the step from this mythological original lustig or pleasure ego to subjectivity proper and to, to the constitution, for example, of, of objective reality, is precisely the step of, let's say, including or taking in not simply some exteriority, but precisely the difference, this crack or gap that separates me from the outside, from what is not me. That this is kind of the, 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 the crucial moment of okay, subjectivation or subjective, to include it precisely, if we now say that this cut produces three things, 
uh, included precisely this third impossible thing which separates me from the outer. There is something. And uh, if I go here into a kind of, uh, I can see even wider digression, but I think it's a very interesting because again it gives us a very palpable uh, perhaps notion of what is at stake here. Uh, you know that in his essay Beyond the Pleasure Principle, uh, Freud ventures at some point into a kind of remarkable speculation uh, uh, as to the genesis of organic individuation. We are one unit, so to say, organically. And he, uh, a primitive organic uh, uh, vesicle that is a small bladder or steel or bubble or hollow structure becomes capable of filtering the continuous and potentially little torrent of external stimuli, says Freud, by sacrificing part of its, itself in order to erect a protective shield against excessive influxes of excitation. And in doing so, it, uh, it, uh, it effects a kind of definitive separation only at that point between the organic interiority and inorganic exteriority. Just, I will just read you this brief passage. He says, uh, the vesicle acquires the shield in this way. Its uttermost surface ceases to have the structure proper to the living matter, becomes to some degree inorganic, and thenceforth functions as a special envelope or membrane resisting to stimuli. In consequence, the energies of the external world are able to pass into the next underlying layers, which have remained living, with only a fragment of their original intensity. By its death, the outer layer has saved all the deeper ones from a similar fate, unless the these stimuli reach it, which are so strong that they break through the protective shield. Now, this is a kind of a very um, interesting piece of uh, speculation and Probably you know that uh, Ray Brasier in his book Nihil Unbound uh, recently made a powerful case out of this passage and uh, pointed out how I mean, precisely this separation between organic interiority and inorganic exteriority or be between inside and outside is one at the cost of the death of part of the primitive organism itself and it is this death that gives rise to the protective shield filtering this potentiality little influences of, of external energy. So individuated organic life is one at the cost of this aboriginal death whereby the organism first becomes capable of separating itself from the inorganic outside. So this, this death which gives birth to organic individuation thereby conditions the possibility of organic Phylogenesis, as well as of, of sexual reproduction. And consequently, not only does this death precede the organism, it is kind of a precondition for the organism's uh, possibility, ability even to reproduce and die. You know, it is kind of a, uh, um, just a kind of uh, side uh, digression to which, nevertheless, I think can. Um, make us perhaps um, understand or feel more concretely uh, w what is at stake in this other configuration that I'm describing. So this undead protective, this dead or undead, this is precisely the question, protective shield is a poignant image to some extent of what is there between the inside and the outside. That of a third thing that emerges with the cut between inside and outside, which is not part of the living being inside, um, incorporate within it, um, uh, and which is neither simply dead or alive. So in this sense, I think it could also serve as a kind of powerful image of this included third, precisely, whereby this third is not something in between death and life. It is not half dead, half life. It is precisely this kind of uh, undead, dead as constitutive, integral part of, of life itself and of its 
in her drive, precisely, because I think this can be then further related to the, the, the whole uh, topics of the drive. Uh, so I think, just a moment, if that makes sense. So just a bit, one more paragraph, and then I think we'll make a pause. Uh, so the negativity included in the subject at its very constitution, the negativity of this difference that differentiates him from the outside, would say uh, uh, negativity included in the subject at its very affirmative constitution, in the very affirmative constitution of the subject, it's a kind of taking in this, this is why I think there is a kind of um, indistinguishable moment here where a negativity and affirm uh, of affirmativity coincide or where there is an affirmation of this negativity by taking it inside. It's not simply, this negativity is not simply did, uh, uh, this or that negativity as exteriority, but the very form, the very form of negation which reveals here its real structure, namely precisely that of with, without. I think this is again a term with which we could very uh, well circumscribe what is at stake here. It is the inside with, without, the, the protective shelter besides this with, without. So the, the cutting off of the future outside reality leaves a mark, a trace, which is precisely what the subject relies upon in its affirmative constitution. So the constitutive affirmation is beachung inevitably takes in also this supplement, this materialization of its own limit, so to say. And it is this limit that constitutes the peculiar third dimension. It's the third dimension which is neither outside nor inside, neither subject nor object, neither something nor absence, but, as I said, has this structure of the with, without. And, of course, uh, the, the curve that this expression indicates or traces. It is what, henceforth, precisely curves the given structure or space or magnetizes this, which is also one of Freud's terms.